All right, your grace time is just about up. Um, as you've been told a couple of times today, the, this is the 16th annual San Jacinto Symposium. 17 years ago, in the LBJ Library, I was approached by an anthropologist from Texas A&M, Sylvia Greider, Dr. Greider. And she said, Dr. Crisp, there's a kid you got to meet. He was an undergraduate at A&M. His name was Andrew Torgan. And she said, you need to watch this guy. He's going to do very well. Well, he's not a kid anymore. He has kids of his own. Um, but uh, both while he was at A&M, when I first met him, and then at the University of Virginia, where he studied with Ed Ayers uh, in the digital history program at the University of Virginia, occasionally coming across that old boundary line down into the, into the, into the darkest North Carolina boondoggles to see me. Um, uh, Andrew Torgett uh, has been pursuing uh, a quest of his own uh, to bring to history um, questions and therefore answers that people had not asked or answered as diligently and as accurately as he has begun to do. If you go online and look for the Texas Slavery Project, uh, you'll see one of his, one of his children. Uh, the Texas Slavery Project is a remarkable blend of cartography, statistics, and historical awareness uh, that will give you a whole new uh, image in your mind of early Texas. Something else that will give you a whole new image in your mind of early Texas, it just did it to me, uh, is his recent book, Seeds of Empire. The subtitle is Cotton Slavery and the Transformation of the Texas Borderlands, 1800 to 1850. Um, I don't read a lot of books that make me say, yeah, I was a little wrong about that. Uh, and in terms of the relationship of slavery to the Texas Revolution, I think I was a little wrong about that. Uh, and you'll need to read Andrew's book, which has just been winning prize after prize uh, this year from a number of organizations. Um, Andrew Torgett is now uh, a, a, a prof associate professor uh, ass assistant professor, this will not last long. Uh, is, it will soon be an associate professor, or maybe just skip that step, uh, uh, but not all the way to Professor Emeritus, which I'm about to do. Um, Andrew is at the University of North Texas, uh, wh who, where he is one of a whole cluster of just remarkable Texas historians up there in far off Denton. Um, a place that my parents knew very well. They're both North Texas graduates. Um, and it's been a, a pleasure uh, to watch Andrew develop and to follow that quest and to follow his path towards becoming one of the most important historians of early Texas. There's no other way to put it. Um, and so it is with extraordinary pleasure that I bring you that grown-up kid soon to be associate professor at least, Andrew Target from the University of North Texas. Hi. Hi. How are you all? All right, I want to say first thank you. Well, thank, thank you to the symposium for having me here. Thank you for all of you for coming out today. This is one of my favorite things I've ever gotten a chance to do is to be here with you guys. I've done one symposium before and absolutely love it because this is one of the things I think is so important about the research that we do at universities is that we get outside the universities and be able to talk about these things with the public and there's no more invested group, I think, than the San Jacinto Conservancy and all the fine work that you guys do. And I love the symposium for those, those reasons. Um, and as uh, Jim was talking about, I've been working on a project for the uh, last several years that finally came out in book form. Um, and that's my only plug for the book itself. But uh, it's, it, it picks up a lot of where um, we've left off in the earliest presentations today about the, the problem of slavery along the border. And what we've been hearing about up until now has been you know, the, the presence of Afro 
um, peoples in Texas and in New Spain, and then also within the southwestern portions of the United States and Louisiana. And in particular, I was particularly moved by some of the presentations about the slave rebellions and people seeking freedom and coming to Texas and using the Sabine River and this line between the United States and New Spain as a place where you can get to freedom and opportunities that you can't have and trying to basically escape the chattel slavery regime in the southern United States. All right? So I want to pick the story up right there with a storm that comes to North America in the form of cotton and the cotton revolution that takes over pretty much the entirety of North America and transforms the United States in ways that we often talk about in the building up to the American Civil War, but also transforms New Spain and Mexico in ways that we haven't often talked about. And Texas is at the absolute epicenter of that. And that is where the Afro-Texan population emerges into numbers that are, that are outstripping the ethnic Mexican population of Texas and changes the story about what it means to be in Texas and be of African descent. And so I want to pick the story up with, the t with this revolution in cotton. And what I always tell my students is to understand the cotton revolution of the early, 20, early 19th century, you have to go across the ocean and go to England, and you have to go to Great Britain. And you have to understand, what I always tell my students is that the British of the 19th century were the most powerful economic, political, and military force that there was. They were to the 19th century what the United States has been since World War II, the largest, most powerful influence. And a lot of the reason that the British had that kind of economic and therefore political and, and military power was their trade empire that they had built across the Atlantic Ocean all over the world. And what it had been built on in many ways was a textile industry that was built out of England that was very powerful, very influential, um, and very, very profitable. And during the late 17th 1700s, late 18th century, um, that textile industry started converting slowly towards cotton, as a, going away from wool as they started feeding their machines raw cotton, which produced a more durable, lightweight, comfortable, and profitable textile, because you could print imagery on these things. You could sell it in a broader array of markets. You could sell a lot more of it. And so they started buying cotton in huge quantities, all right? Around that same time, the late, late, 18, late 1700s, early 1800s, there's the invention of several uh, machines that would take the seeds out of cotton fibers, gin them, that comes from engine, as you run them through these machines, making it even more profitable. And at the end of the, of the War of 1812, all right, when the, our relations with the British go back to a semi kind of Cold War sort of status after the War of 1812, the British start buying cotton again in huge numbers post War of 1812. And the price of cotton explodes during the 18 teens, absolutely goes through the roof. It doubles in 1815 from 15 cents a pound to 30 cents a pound. Now think about that. The price, the, the profitability of cotton doubles in 1815. What is the result? A massive migration of Americans down to the Gulf Coast, which turns out to be one of the best and most profitable places to grow cotton in this era because it's warm, it has a long growing season, therefore, it has alluvial soils, it has a great river system, so you can ship cotton down to the coast. It turns out to be a fabulous place to grow large quantities of cotton. And so from 1815 up till 1820, you have one of the biggest migrations, one of the most important migrations in American history of people by the hundreds of thousands hurtling themselves into the territories that become Mississippi, that become Alabama and going into what was already Louisiana, but that Gulf Coast core that will become the epicenter of the Confederacy, the Cotton South, explodes during the 18th in absolutely massive numbers, where people are pouring down to this territory, land that had been taken from the native groups that lived in that area during the War of 1812, and had been ripped open, and is being torn into this new plantation districts, these new plantation areas that are brand new farms that are trying to create what you see on the screen there, which are factories in the field for cotton production. And so cotton production in the United States just blows up during the 18-teens until by 1820, we, the United States, emerge as the largest cotton-producing nation in the world. We surpass India. And we are the main supplier of this British textile industry, which is growing at a rapid pace on the cotton that's coming from the United States. And so the British will depend on cotton from the United States, from Mississippi, from Alabama. 85% of the massive textile industry's cotton intake in Great Britain comes from Mississippi River Valley plantations. 
all right, in huge and massive numbers. Now, the reason this matters for what we're talking about today is that not all of those hundreds of thousands of people, there's 370,000 who get there by 1820, not all of them are coming voluntarily. The vast majority of them are, well, a large percentage of them are not. It will, it will exceed 50% in places like Mississippi by the 1850s. Around this time, it's about 40% of the population that's coming to these places are men, women, and children who are being forced to come in a forced migration to be a part of this cotton explosion that's going on here, as enslaved labor becomes the underlying labor force that is making all of this possible that is underlying every bit of this. Every third person in Alabama was enslaved by 1820. Half of all Louisianans were. And this is the epicenter and at the core of all of this as it's expanding these plantation districts in the American South, in the, what become the Deep South, all right? The reason this matters in so much form for what we're talking about in Texas is that the population numbers explode next to the Spanish border during this period because of that. 370,000 Americans have poured into the territories right next to Texas during the 18th. So that by 1820, you've got about 370,000 people in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. We're not even counting Arkansas here, although there are people there as well for the same reasons. In Texas, there are around 3,000 non-Indians living in Texas, the Spaniards that will be known as Tejanos, who live in San Antonio, La Bahia, and Nacogdoches. There's about 3,000 of them. You can see the population imbalance right there, right? Mexico City could see this population imbalance and got nervous about this circumstance. They realized that there's nothing really keeping the Americans from being able to pour over the border if they want to. There's no reason for them to at this point. There's a lot of cheap land in the Mississippi River Valley. They don't need to come down to the territory. The bigger danger actually comes from the fact that you have that many plantations coming in around the Mississippi River Valley, and what do they need to run their farms? Besides enslaved labor, they think, they also need horses and mules. They need draft animals to be able to pull the plows that tear up these fields, to be able to turn the cotton gins, their horsepower, to be able to turn those around and to be able to cart bales of, of, uh, of cotton down to the river or supplies back up. They need horses and they need a lot of them. You know what they don't have in the Mississippi River Valley? A lot of horses. They just don't have that supply. And they start casting about for where they can get some. And the fact that this is so close to Texas, so close to the plains regions of Texas, means that the Comanches come and fill this role of supplying horses to cotton plantations in the Mississippi River Valley. We usually don't think of the Comanches <laughs> when you think of Mississippi cotton. But at this time, there's such demand for horses, and the Comanches, who control the entire Plains territory by this point, and are the undisputed masters of this territory, um, immediately start raiding what Spanish settlements there are in the territory and start herding horses down towards Natchitoches, um, towards Louisiana, towards Mississippi to sell these horses to these growing plantations because they can, and they can get weaponry as a result of that. And American traders were happy to turn horses into weapons for the Comanches because it was good for them, it was good for the Comanches. It was not good, however, for the Spanish settlements in Texas. And so as a result, of the explosion of the cotton regime in the Mississippi River Valley, you suddenly have this, this massive amount of Comanche raiding that had been going on but reaches new levels in the 18 teens, the late 18 teens, as this horse trade comes through Nacogdoches. You guys can see on the map up there, one of the most developed roads during this entire period was the Camino Comanche that went from Nacogdoches up towards the Comanche territories right there. It was described by the Tejanos in San Antonio as more developed than the Camino Real or the road that went from La Bahia east towards, uh, towards Louisiana because there's so much traffic going on there. And the Comanches raided just in such huge numbers, they literally destroyed San Antonio and La Bahia. I mean, just drove them into the ground. They start raiding into northern New Spain. They go into Tamaulipas, Nueva Leon, Coila, they destroy huge areas right there. By the 1820s, 75% of the entire military budget that New Spain is allocating to this territory is being spent explicitly on dealing with this Comanche raiding that's being pushed by the, the cotton markets in the American South. So you can imagine, this is devastating, the lives of the Spaniards, the Tejanos who live in this territory, who by 1820 are literally on the edge of abandoning Texas. You read the letters of Antonio Martinez, the governor of Texas at this time, he's writing in desperation to anyone who will listen, particularly the viceroy in Mexico City saying, we're, 
we're about to leave. We can't hold on. This has been destroyed. When you combine what the Comanches were doing with the aftermath of the Mexican War for independence and all the violence that produced that, you have this moment by 1820 where everything is on the verge of collapse. And that matters because when Moses Austin shows up in 1820, making his proposal to bring American families in, into Texas. My students have a hard time. I teach the Texas History Survey every semester, and they have a hard time saying, why would they do this? Why would, this, why would the Tejanos agree to anything like this? It seems like a really bad idea, given what we know happens later. And I say, first off, they don't know what happens next. But secondly, you have to understand the position that they're in by 1820 is one of desperation. So when Moses Austin shows up and Stephen Austin takes over after him, what they're offering is the least bad option now available to the Tejanos in this circumstance. It's not a great option, but it's, it's better than having to abandon the territory, right? And what they're offering, what the Austins are offering, is to bring the cotton frontier to Texas. They're offering to bring cotton planters to Texas. The Panic of 1819 had raised prices uh, on land in the United States to levels that pushed most uh, farmers out of the market and they couldn't compete. And so the Austins were offering to redirect this cotton frontier into Texas. So they would set up, they would bring farmers in here, just like they'd done in the Mississippi River Valley, to build um, plantations, to build um, cotton fields that would build this whole territory. The reason that sounded so appealing is because this would bring in non-Comanches into the territory, which Tejanos desperately wanted. They needed. They needed anybody, basically, at this point. And so, for, for one, they were very interested in that, and they thought that would be something that would help them stabilize their own presence in the territory and keep them from abandoning it. But a second reason that people like, this is Jose Antonio Navarro, um, who thought this was a good idea, and worth supporting, is that the Tejanos could see what the cotton frontier had done for the southwestern United States. They had gone to New Orleans. They had, I mean, the, the leading traders in San Antonio made regular trips to New Orleans in order to get supplies, bring back to northern New Spain, trade there. When they had been to New Orleans, that's the largest slave trading and cotton trading port in the southern United States. They saw what was going on there. They saw the wealth. They saw the development. They saw the rapid uh, building up of this territory. And they wanted that for Texas. They wanted that for their communities. They wanted this, not just the, the stability of having non-Comanches in a larger proportion of the territory. They wanted the economic boom that Cotton had brought to the southwestern United States. And so they buy into this idea of bringing in Austin, the Austins and their, their colonists for all of these reasons and give the green light um, for folks to come in. So they open up the territory. They endorse the Austin petition. After Moses Austin dies, they back up his son, Stephen F. Austin, as the inheritor of this grant. And they say, please, throw open the gates of Texas. Bring in these Anglo colonists, who they hope will become, by the way, Anglo-Mexicans. All right, we're talking about race and identity and things like that. Their idea is that these will be people will be incorporated into the Mexican nation, all right? And this will be a part of building up this territory long term. And so they throw open the gates of Texas to cotton, to migration, to all of these people. And people come pouring in. Hundreds of families come into Texas, lots of single men who also get bunched up into quote unquote families under Austin's grant. But you have thousands of people coming into this territory, building these plantations, building these houses. And the way that we usually talk about these stories is that we focus on the big house right there in the middle. People like Jared Gross, who come to Texas during this time period, who are the, the planters who are coming into Austin's colony. Partly because we know their names, partly because we have images of their faces. These are the people we concentrate on. But look behind there. All those, all those slave cabins that are being built behind there, those people are coming as well because they're being forced to come into Texas. They're being brought into Texas, as Mississippi is being brought into Texas. The same thing that's being done in the Mississippi River Valley is what's being brought into Texas. And so you have enslaved people, men, women, children, who are being brought into Texas against their will, in most cases, like almost exclusively um, being brought against their will, into Texas in coffles like this, who are being brought to labor in the fields to build these plantation houses. And they do. Jared Gross, one of the most famous settlers of Austin's colony because he's the most wealthy one who comes, who brings 90 slaves with him. That's a huge number of people. 
But he's the exception to the rule. Most of the planters who come are bringing one slave, two slaves, if they are wealthy enough to actually own slaves. But those who do come and the slaves who are brought, they start clearing fields. They start building cabins. They start building roads. They start building the infrastructure that allows this cotton economy to come to Texas. They build cotton gins. They build bridges across these rivers. They build landings to bring the cotton bales to. They are building all of these things that makes this economy possible and makes this area attractive to the Anglo colonists who are coming in, who are bringing them in, who are having them grow cotton. And cotton is sown from the very earliest settlements in Texas in Austin's colony. Between the Colorado and the Brazos River, they start clearing fields and growing cotton almost immediately. And they start building cotton gens to clean it and start getting routes to New Orleans to sell it. All right? It becomes the epicenter of the economy from the very word go, and it will remain so through the American Civil War. All right? This is the epicenter of all of that. And so the result is, by 1825, enslaved people constitute a full quarter of Austin's colony. Every fourth person, if you went in a time machine and got to Austin's colony, every fourth person you encountered would be an enslaved man, woman, or child. It's there from the word go, from the absolute word go. And here's the thing about all of this. Mexico had approved none of this. <laughs> because the, the, the grants were made under the Spanish regime. When Spain was overthrown, Mexico became independent. Austin arrived, Stephen F. Austin arrived in San Antonio literally weeks after the news had arrived. And he's told by the Tejanos, don't worry about it. Go set up your colony. We'll figure it out. We've got your back. Meanwhile, in Mexico City, uh, this new Mexican nation has to decide what it is, what it's going to be, and what they're going to do about Anglo colonization, about problems and questions like slavery. And so in 1823, Mexico calls a constitutional convention to answer these questions, to write a new constitution for the Mexican nation. And so um, representatives from across this new Mexico are brought to Mexico City where they start debating all of these issues about what this country is going to look like. And what's really interesting is that the question of Anglo colonization, whether we should allow the Americans to come into Mexico, turns out to be not very controversial. Actually, not controversial at all. Most people in Mexico City recognized it wasn't their first option. They would have preferred not to allow the Americans to come in. But given the circumstances, thanks to the Comanches, we don't have many other options. We need people. The Americans want to come in. This is, a, this is fine. We'll approve this. And so Anglo colonization of Texas never is in real danger when Mexico starts writing its national charter. There is one thing, however, that is under dispute, and that is that these Anglo-Americans insist on bringing enslaved African-Americans with them. And this becomes terribly controversial within Mexico City because Slavery is a very difficult question for the early government of Mexico. They're a new nation. They need international help. They need international friends. And they've just fought a war for liberty. So there are three main reasons why Mexi most Mexicans, almost virtually every Mexican in this new Mexican nation comes into agreement that slavery is a bad thing. We don't want slavery written into our national charter. And we don't want slavery in Mexico. And the three reasons that they agree on this is first, they had just fought a war for liberty and independence. It's the same contradiction that the United States realizes it's at its moment of, of birth, that to endorse slavery really runs against uh, the, the, the pronouncements of, uh, of Morelos, of Hidalgo before him, anti-slavery, all of that. We're fighting a war for liberty. We don't want to endorse slavery at this particular moment, right? So that's one reason. Second reason is uh, that there are very few enslaved people of Afri African descent in Mexico at this time. Uh, Dr. De La Teja explained this earlier. There's about 3,000 enslaved people in Mexico at this time. So to get rid of slavery would entail giving up very little. There's not much challenge in any of that. We can just give up slavery and not be sacrificing very much. All right. But the third reason was the most powerful by far, which is they're a new nation that's dead broke, essentially, at the moment of independence. What does Mexico need? International friends. And what is the most powerful international nation at this time that you need agreements with and probably loans from if you're going to survive? The British. And the British have come out by this moment as one of the most stridently anti-slave 
slavery nations in the world. They've come out against the international slave trade. They will increasingly ratchet up their, their efforts at abolitionism and stamping out slavery worldwide. And the British just happen to be the largest investors in the Mexican economy and the Mexican mine systems at this time. So you don't want to upset the British. You need their help. Endorsing slavery will put Mexico at a serious disadvantage. So almost all Mexicans can agree, we need to get rid of slavery. It's a terrible thing. There is just one exception to this. Those who were in Texas. And so Stephen F. Austin himself goes down to Mexico City and says very explicitly to everybody who will listen to him, listen guys, we need slavery. Not because I like slavery, says Austin, not because I think it's a good idea. It's a necessary means to a good end, which is the development of Texas. People, cotton, as he says right here, the primary product that will elevate us from poverty is cotton. And as he says, we cannot do this without the help, I'm going to put help in quotes there, um, of slaves, right? And, and the point is that Austin and the Tejanos, because it's really the Tejanos who are the power brokers throughout this entire time period. They are the representatives to the Mexican government in Mexico City and then in the uh, state legislatures later. They're the ones who are representing all of this. And the Tejanos are on board hand in hand with Stephen F. Austin and the Anglos in defending slavery. Again, not because of slavery for its own sake, but for what slavery can provide for the territory in terms of migration and economic development. And they make a very dire case in Mexico City. They say very explicitly, you get rid of slavery, no more American immigration to Texas. You do that, you basically turn it over to the Comanches, the Apaches. You give up that territory, making Mexico weak and vulnerable. And so these are the debates that happen in Mexico City. And so in 1824, when Mexico City publishes its new national constitution, its federalist constitution, which divides power between Mexico City and the different states. You know, this gets published, it's sent up to Texas, the first copies arrive, they throw it open to read, what does it say about slavery? Because that's gonna be the epicenter of what happens next. And they look through and they, they get to the whole thing and they realize the constitution doesn't say a single word about slavery. And that wasn't on accident. That was very purposeful. Because the Mexicans, Mexican Constitutional Convention decided that the easiest and most rational thing to do here was to not say anything about slavery at all. You wouldn't outlaw it nationally. You would instead make it an issue for the states to decide. Anything that wasn't uh, explicitly given to the Mexican national government was an issue for the individual states to decide. That would make it easier for the different states to do whatever they wanted, all right? Which is much what the United States Constitution attempts to do in 1789. Um, and so most Mexicans realize that most Mexican states will outlaw slavery. There's just that one crazy, pesky little area up in northeastern Mexico that might keep slavery for a little while, but we'll see how long, all right? It's, it's, it's Texas, obviously. But here's the thing, all right? The Texans probably were like cheering for a minute when they're saying, all right, we get to decide our own, our own issues here. And then they read a little further and realize, oh wait, we're not our own state. <laughs> Texas have been joined to Coahuila. All right? And a lot of that is, again, the legacy of the Spanish failure to populate Texas. There just weren't enough people in Texas to, to justify a state, was what a lot of the arguments were made by north, northeastern states in Mexico. So it's joined to Coahuila, which means those same debates about slavery that had happened in Mexico City are simply kicked northward up to Saltillo, the capital of Coahuila where the Coelans will have the majority hand in what happens in Texas because they're gonna decide the slavery issue. And in the state legislature in Saltillo, this is the main plaza on Saltillo, um, they're gonna have this legislature that comes together and 10 of the members of this legislature are gonna be Coelans and one, and only one, is going to be from Texas. Who's gonna get outvoted every single time on every single issue? The Texan, right? And so the debates move northward again to Saltillo. And in Saltillo, the same fights happen again. There's many Coelans who emerge as anti-slavery, just as their brethren in Mexico City from all over the country have been very anti-slavery. Once again, the, the Anglo-Tejano alliance within Texas comes out full force in favor of slavery as a means to a, the end of developing Texas by cotton. And so you have Austin sending his brother, James, who went by the name Brown, which I always love to say, James Brown went to Saltillo, right? Um, 
He sends his brother down there. The Tejanos have a, a, a fierce uh, presence within Saltillo, and they make the case there to any Coelan who will listen to them and saying, listen, we don't really like slavery in its own way, but we think it's necessary to these good ends. And they win over a portion of Coelans. And here's the thing about slavery. The closer Mexicans were to the United States, the more likely it was that they would support slavery for the economic system that it produced. All right? And so you have this group of Coelans, all right, led by the Viesca brothers. This is, uh, this is um, Augustin Viesca, his brother Jose Maria Viesca, are the two power brokers on a liberal wing of the, um, of the Saltillo legislature. And they join forces with the Tejanos and the Anglos to endorse slavery and to keep the cotton economy alive. But that's only a portion of the Coelans. There are other Coelans who forcefully oppose slavery coming into the territory, surviving in the territory, and some of their objections are based on their experiences with the way chattel slavery played out in the United States. So I have a great quote from you guys up here by Jose Francisco Madero, who was a representative from Northern Coela, who came out just vehemently against the idea of endorsing slavery in, in Texas because of what he'd seen in New Orleans. He gave this very impassioned speech on the floor of the Congress where he basically says, not basically he does, he says, I was in New Orleans, I saw the slave pens, I saw these things in action. He, remembers, he, he remembered being in a cafe where these two Anglo-Americans are arguing about African-Americans saying that, quote, they're the same as mules and should be treated as such, all right? And he's saying that's not, that, that doesn't recognize the inerrant humanity in these people. This is not something we should endorse. This is not a system that we can get behind. And this is a clash that happens within Coelho. There's these amazing debates that happen in Saltillo about the future of slavery in North America, where Ameri Anglo-Americans, Mexican-Americans, oh, not Mexican-Americans, uh, Mexicans, Coelans and Texans are arguing and fighting over these questions on the floor of the state Congress where they're scre literally screaming and yelling at each other. Until finally the state constitution of Coahuila and Texas is forged and published in March 1827. And this is a culminating moment in the colonization of Texas because everybody knows everything is on the line with this state constitution. All right? And so the mail is sent from Saltillo when it's published. It comes up to San Antonio. They get it. They, they, they throw the first copy of this thing on the ground. They open it up and they start reading through and looking for the, the articles on slavery. And they get to Article 13. And it's Article 13 of the State Constitution of 1827 that deals directly with slavery. And here's what it says. Slavery is going to end in Texas and Coahuila, but slowly. So what the Coelans decided to do was to put in these gradual measures of emancipation. All right? They saw this as a kind of compromise sort of measure, as a way of ending slavery eventually, but not jarring the situation in Texas immediately. All right? So here's how it worked. The, Coela, the Article 13 said, one, everybody's a slave in Texas will remain a slave for life. Nobody's getting freed right now. Nobody. They also said, and for you planters who are already in Texas, you cotton farmers who want slavery so much, we're going to give you a six-month window to stock up. Bring in slaves, as many as you can bring in from New Orleans, as many as you can bring in from the American South. Bring in as many slaves. You have six whole months. Bring in as many as you want. All of those people will also be slaves for life. The only people who are going to be freed are those children of those enslaved people. That is when freedom will start. And so freedom will take a generation, essentially. That's the idea here. Eventually, this area will be uh, free of, of slavery itself, but it will take a generation, which means that there's nobody going to be freed immediately. They saw this as a compromise measure that would please probably everybody. Please the Coelans because it's going to be over. Probably make the Texans happy because they have time to repair, to adjust, to deal with it. The Texans did not react that way. <laughs> All right, the Anglos and Tejanos, I mean. I'm not, I'm not saying, speaking for the African Americans in Texas at the time. Um, but the people like Stephen F. Austin and the Tejanos who collaborated with him were aghast. And they said, this is a travesty of huge proportions. Not because these plantations are going to be challenged immediately. No one's going to be free. They're not worried about the actual movement on the plantations themselves as they're currently operating. What they're worried about is that in six more months, Nobody else is coming to Texas because you will no longer be able to bring enslaved men, women, and children from Mississippi, from Alabama, 
And this is a real concern because 90%, that's a 9-0, 90% of the people who came to Austin's colony came from the Deep South. They came from Mississippi, not Maine. They came from Alabama, not Illinois because of the cotton economy. And they recognize that if you're competing with Mississippi for settlers, you can't afford to not have the labor system that you have in Mississippi. So this is a crisis of the biggest proportions because it means there will be no more migration, there'll be no more development. Austin sees the death of his colony and the Tejanos see the death of their investment in the development of the territory. And so they've got to find a way around this. So they come up with a solution, a scheme to get around all of this. And their scheme is born in Austin's colony. He calls an emergency meeting of the leading colonists where they sit around, they pound the table saying, what do we do? How do we deal with this? And the plan they come up with is fairly devious. Their idea is pretty simple in, in, when it sounds, but it has, it, has, it has serious consequences. Their idea is they're going to ask for a law from the Coila legislature that sounds innocent. The law is going to say that any contract you enter into in the United States will be valid in Mexico. So if you hire somebody, a carpenter, in New Orleans to build you a house, all right, when you get to Mexico, that, law will, that, that contract will still be legal. Sounds really simple. And it has to be if it's going to get through Saltillo. What are they going to use it for? To force the enslaved people when they get to the Louisiana border of Texas to be freed. And then they'll have them sign 99-year service contracts. After which, of course, they're free to go, do whatever they want. Unless, of course, they're in debt when their children will then take on that debt. You know, if that works out that way long term, so be it. It's a, it's a legal ruse, right? That's the whole concept. It's to just call slavery something other than slavery. Call it a contract labor, indented servitude, whatever you want. But if it gets around the law of Article 13, then this will work. So the Anglos propose this. They send it to San Antonio, where the Tejanos hold it up and say, this is a great idea. And they take it to... Saltillo. Jose Antonio Navarro is the man who takes it to the floor of the Saltillo legislature and he stands up there and he says, listen guys, we need to pass this because we need, we need to assure uh, people who might come to Texas it'll be okay. There's a lot of guys from Ohio who want to come down here. <laughs> he literally says that. He says there's people from Ohio who want to come down but they're terrified that contracts won't be honored here. So can we get this law passed? And they say, sure, that's fine. Seems simple. And so they pass it. They pass the law as Decree 56, and it's amazing. And Navarro, as soon as it's passed, he sends this letter to Austin saying, I can't believe it worked. And it goes through, he says, I, we got the law passed. And Austin is just happens to be ready. He's got a blank contract, fill in the blank, that he then sends to the newspapers in New Orleans that is then published in New Orleans, it's published around the American South, and it shows here's how you get around the laws preventing slavery in Mexico. Just come to New Orleans get a signed contract, and then you can come on in and they're not slaves anymore. They're indented servants, all right? It's a legal ruse to get around things, right? But you can see why this would get the attention of Mexican authorities at every level and start causing conflicts, all right? So people continue to pour in from the southern United States, Anglo planters and uh, enslaved African Americans who are being brought against their will into Texas as the plantation economy and, and system is developing just as it had in the Mississippi River Valley. The difference here is it's now being underpinned by a legal ruse. And in New Orleans, here's what happened. You have all these planters get to New Orleans, and then they sign these contracts. You have to have it notarized, just as today you'll have legal matters notarized, right? So they go to the notary publics in New Orleans, and one of the notary public offices just happens to be really close to the office of the Mexican consul in New Orleans. And so the Mexican consul sees these lines of enslaved people and their masters standing there waiting to get contracts signed. And he goes over and asks, and the, the notary public tells him, this is what's happening. This is how we're getting around Mexican law. I got a lot of business. And the Mexican consul starts sending angry letters to Mexico City. He sends them to Saltillo. News gets out about this very, very quickly. All right, so this, is not, this doesn't stay a secret terribly long. And what this does is this joins other things that have been happening in Texas. The Fredonian Rebellion of December 1826, a report that is done by Manuel de Miri Terran about the situation in East Texas in the late 1820s. All of this gets to Mexico City, where an increasing fear within Mexico City of what's happening, not just in Texas, but all over the, the, the Mexican nation, produces this move towards centralization and this effort to try to reassert control over places like Texas, these far-flung frontiers. 
And so in 1830, Mexico City tries to reassert its national authority over Texas, and this is deliciously ironic considering current debates, but tries to seal the border with the United States and keep Americans from coming over. So the law of April 6, 1830, Mexico tries to cut off American immigration into Texas, all right? And it doesn't work, all right? It doesn't work for a lot of reasons, all right? For one thing, it doesn't have any support within Texas or even northern Mexico. Um, Tejanos join Anglos in protesting all of this. But one of the major reasons that it doesn't work in any way, shape, or form is because there's a cotton boom that begins in 1830. At this exact same moment, Cotton prices once again go through the roof as they had in the late 18-teens. Remember in 1815 when the price of cotton doubles and there's this massive migration that follows? That happens in the 1830s. Prices go up in New Orleans, New York, and Liverpool, heights they'd never seen before. It goes from 1830 to 1835. It creates this massive rush for cotton lands. And so people pour into Texas despite the law of April 6, 1830, despite any effort of Mexico City to reassert control over this territory. So much so that the population of Texas goes from 10,000 to 21,000 from 1830 to 1835. It more than doubles at the exact same moment Mexico City is trying to clamp down on this territory. And that plays out in all kinds of different ways in different conflicts in 1832, 1833, but the result is essentially the same. You have this massive migration in at the same time Mexico City is trying to uh, create control of this territory, it's lost over this time period. Those are the conflicts that ultimately lead to the 1835-1836 Texas Revolution. And what's amazing about that is that by 1835, you have approximately 5,000 enslaved men, women, and children in Texas and a smattering of free African Americans within the territory. 5,000. The reason that's so significant is that they are there because of this economic transformation of cotton. They are connected to the Mississippi River Valley that's now connecting them to Mexico City. That is a bridge between all of these territories, and there are more enslaved African Americans in Texas than there are ethnic Mexicans by this point. African American population outstripped the Mexican population in Texas by the late 1820s. And as a part of and parcel of this massive transformation that's creating these conflicts of power in this overlapping borderland region connecting both the United States and Mexico that will ultimately culminate in the Texas Revolution of 1835 and in 1836. And several speakers after me are going to speak about the, the fighting and the, and the opportunities that were uh, given to African Americans who ran for their freedom, who joined different sides, who were a part of these different experiences and are enmeshed in this revolutionary moment. But what's really amazing to me about the Texas Revolution and I get a chance to talk about in my book is that in the aftermath of this, the Anglo-Americans will create the Republic of Texas as a nation built on cotton and therefore dedicated to slavery. It is everything that the Confederate States of America will later try to establish. The difference is the Confederates lose their war in 1865. The Texans succeed and for nine whole years are able to try out this idea of a slaveholders republic on the national stage. It is the closest thing we have to an experiment that would show us what the future would have looked like for the Confederacy if they had somehow won their war, but they didn't. And the, uh, the example of the Republic of Texas shows us that the future of the Confederacy would have been probably very bleak as the Republic faced international condemnation for its, con its attachments to slavery and when the cotton markets collapse in 1837 and they're a one crop economy, they have the same, um, they have the same problems that any one, 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 um, one um, item uh, economy uh, deals with. The economy goes through the floor, leaving them uh, broke direct and in desperate need of annexation to the United States in 1845 to save the Republic and to save basically what they created with this cotton economy in Texas. So thank you guys very much.